there's so many reports out there of uh, the fact that Jesus did exist, and, and people are arguing, they've been arguing for, I don't know, maybe, is it could it be a thousand years, more probably? Is this something that you found as well, that there might have been some historical char characters around in that area that had that had the potentiality that might have been Jesus? Well, a good question, because if we start from the premise, there is this Jesus in the fictional stories that we find in the Gospels, we do ask the question then, well, was he inspired by somebody else? Is this superhero that we read about in the Gospels, is this actually simply an embellished version of a more modest but striking character? Now, I'd say, well, that's not a bad start, except do not confine your consideration to a single character, because I think that is a mistake to imagine that, well, the story began with one particular guy, whether he was a radical, a rebel, whether he was a revisionist rabbi, whether he was a philosopher. It's not a question of finding one person behind the legend. It's a question of mapping out the many behind the legend, because Jesus is a composite character. He integrates into himself all these preceding prototypes and he reflects parts of each of them and the whole process of mapping out the story of Jesus is really tracing down where a particular incident, an episode in his so-called life, where his particular wisdom statements or parables, where these actually originated and they come from many sources. And what would you say in terms of some of the uh... The, uh, the the different sources that are out there now. I, I reckon much of it comes obviously from Josephus. Uh, I, I guess Peter wrote some of this stuff as well. And we, obviously there's a difference that we can get into later uh, in, in in terms of the Old Testament and the New Testament, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what are directly some of the sources? D did you go to the Bible and then try to verify some of the statements there? Or how did you go about this research and come to this conclusion? Well, yes, of course, we, we have to go to the Bible in the first instant and continuously. I, I read the, the, the Bible nearly every day, <laughs> something that few people could do who are not actually Christians. Yes, the character of Jesus of Nazareth reflects many prototypes, but above all, it reflects Old Testament prototypes. In Jesus, we find reflections of many of those heroes of the Old Testament, all the way from Adam through to Elisha and Elijah. These stories are also reflected in the Jesus story. And of course, New Testament scholars or, or believers of the story are in complete agreement on that. But they have a special word to describe the fact that Jesus seems to be a retelling of something of an earlier story because they call that fulfillment. It's this very special word of the, of the Christians use that if, if an, the story is repeated, it's not simply copying, it is actually fulfillment, which takes a, a, a certain mindset to go with that particular idea. What do you think about, uh, again, if we go back to that idea that there's so many people who are, who are arguing this now as well, uh, Michael Tessarian brought to my attention for something called the Jesus Seminar, uh, this group of 150 individuals and, and they're, they're studying and trying to uh, reconstruct this idea of the of the historical uh, the historical Jesus. Have you heard about this this group? And if so, what do you what do you think about some of their? Oh 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 yes. I mean, the Jesus Seminar has been in existence for quite some years now. How can we put it in context? In the last two centuries, people began to assess the Bible in a scholarly fashion. People have raised doubts, and no more so than some of the original theologians who looked at this material. They were the ones who had access to it, they were the ones who could read it and interpret it, and they could see some of the problems with it in the first instance. Now, this movement of evaluating from an historical perspective of the Bible and the New Testament in particular, it's, it's often gone under the idea of the quest for the, for the historical Jesus. In other words, trying to find the man behind the legend. And there have been two or three such quests for the historical Jesus, each one really coming up with nothing and, and simply explaining why it's such a difficult task. Now, in that movement, in a loose sense of the term, you know, we have the Jesus Seminar. 
people interested in the subject, theologians, historians, and people of faith and people not of faith, and they have looked at, collectively, the stories and the dialogue of, of the New Testament. And the figures escape me off the top of my head, but their original conclusions were that something like 85% of what Jesus had supposedly said was not true, and 85% of, of, of what he supposedly did was not true. Now, that was their assessment at that stage. Basically, they were saying this group of collective wisdom concluded that nearly everything was simply mythological. How, how far back do you think we can go with this then in terms of, because at some point we, I guess we have to begin with genealogy as well. I mean, if, if Jesus is the spawn of, of, of King David and, and earlier characters, then maybe those uh, people also have to be proven to exist. And uh, or, or already at that point, if, if they uh, are can't be proven that they existed, then obviously their spawn is going to be um, qu qu put into question as well, if I put it that way, right? Indeed it does. And I'd say now the layers of evidence which undermine the claims for the historical Jesus are very substantial. We can demolish the claims of, of the New Testament by a number of different avenues, each of which supports the others and collectively is overwhelming. Yes, you touch on the fact of the dynasty of King David. This is the, the famous lineage of Jesus. He is the inheritor of the Jewish throne, as it were. Now, for some time now, archaeologists and historians of that period have been cast in doubt on the whole basis of the of the Jewish story as it were they doubt the existence of the patriarchs they doubt the existence of the exodus they doubt that, uh, that any of these events of the, of the of the conquest of the land of Canaan of the, of the origins of the of the Jews and so on all of this is now in great difficulty as, as a belief system. Now, that alone, that is before we even move on to the New Testament period, if this character originates from a mythological dynasty, then the question collapses at that early point already. Yeah. So what do you think? Do you think that there were a, a King David? I know that obviously there's archaeological digs happening in uh, Palestine all the time, in, in the search for for some of these people. And, and once in a while, obviously, they find some inter interesting stuff. They find remnants of temples. And obviously, at this point, as far as I understand it, it's just an interpretation of who that might have been belonged to. Uh, I remember articles myself reading about how they speculate that King uh, King David's, and even King Solomon's, I think in some cases, uh, well, uh, sorry, King David's palace has been found and things like that. Uh, but, but what do you make of that? Do you, do you think it's all um, hodgepodge? Do they just put this together? Or do you think that they might actually find something in, in uh, Palestine slash uh, Israel? Then? Well, it's extraordinary. I mean, we are dealing here with entrenched ideology and it's all mixed up with current politics as well. It's rather like enthusiasts for Area 51 and visiting astronauts will never accept there wasn't visitors from space landing in Nevada. People committed to the classic biblical story will not accept the evidence that says otherwise. And so it does divide scholarship into those who are believers before they become academics and people who are ac academics without a prevailing belief system that they insist has to be so. Yes, it's true. I mean, it's a continuous vexation and, and amusement at the same time that every so often something is produced and it is announced to the world's press, here is the first evidence of, and it might be King David, it might be Jesus. I mean, typically they find the first evidence of Jesus just before Christmas. Just before Christmas each year there's an announcement they've found something to validate Jesus. And what is really striking about that is the, the way in which they are obliged to announce it is the first evidence. You know, all the previous attempts have been shown to be to be to be complete nonsense. But because these people are so committed to finding their biblical story, they will go on announcing that they've done so. But it is down to interpretation, unfortunately. Hmm. So, what do you think if we're going to the question of why this have? Have happened, or I mean, this—it's—it's it's obviously divided into two different uh, 
ways here. We can look at it from the point of view of history and, and the fact that um, Jesus adopted uh, this this role of the, of the mythological hero, if you will, a little bit, this kind of archetype, and, and he is a composite character, if you will, of, of some of the previous entities, or de deities, rather, that, that uh, was... Uh, looked up to, looked up to at that, at that point, but then we have obviously the the new uh, aspect to this is what is happening today in terms of politics, and even if we're going to the establishment of of the state of Israel and even into Zionism and things like that. But which of, of these two would you like to begin to talk a little bit about uh, in terms of the historical background and the mythology, or, or where we are today in terms of, of the political uh, uh, scene uh, right now? You, I, I, what I thought perhaps you were touching on there is this claim that Jesus was actively trying to fulfil a role, which is sometimes one of the, the, the apologetics of how it is that some of his stories are almost word-for-word word copies of earlier stories. And it's sometimes suggested, well, yes, and Jesus, this actual individual, he knew the story, therefore he played the part. He was acting the part to go with it. I mean, that is sometimes thrown into the mix. But I may be misinterpreting what you were saying there. No, it's, it's all right, but do you think that it's all... It's all mythology, then, basically, if you look at it that, that from that point of view. It's all just a, a story to you. Is that correct? Well, let's say what is true. It is true that Judea and Galilee and Samaria and, and, and that whole area of the eastern Mediterranean was absorbed into the Roman Empire. We know that. There is evidence of that. We can all, as tourists, go and climb over it and look at it. So there is no doubt the historical setting is valid. And unfortunately, that is what misleads so many people. The number of times we will see those documentaries which will show a picture of a Roman fort, a Roman road or a Roman bath and then say quite glibly and this is the sort of road that Jesus would have walked down and, and this is the sort of place that Jesus would have visited. The context is valid. What isn't valid, this fictional character intruded into the story. And why can we say that with such certainty? Well, one obvious thing is nobody noticed him. Nobody noticed him. Everything about Jesus comes from a later time. Mm -hmm, yeah. We've touched upon the problem with the royal family of David. That's a problem. Now we have another problem. In this period of time, which was very well documented, nobody, friend or foe, seems to have noticed him pulls up another bit of apologetics that we have to confront, that those who defend this story have to maintain that Jesus was both impressing the multitudes and whole cities and turning the world upside down, but at the same time doing it all out of the way in places so that nobody actually noticed it. It's an untenable position, but they have to do that because people who should have noticed this character and the movement he supposedly started just didn't notice it. So when you say that some of this record, is that primarily from the the Roman, um, the Roman Empire and their records that they put down, or, or whose, whose uh, scripture or text or uh, documents are we referring to that? Well... If we start with the biblical story, according to Acts, very soon after the grand finale, the, the crucifixion, the, the Jesus movement started, and in very short order, it had several thousand, at one point it says 5,000 Mao members. Now, this is in a city, if we assume an equal number of women, that's about 10,000 people. We are talking about one third of the population of the entire city. Now, how is it that historians at that time didn't notice such a movement, didn't make a comment to the effect, my gosh, things are really happening in Jerusalem, a third of the population has, has come out supporting this man who rose from the dead. They say no such thing. When we read Josephus, who talks about what was happening in his own lifetime, he doesn't describe this movement at all. He describes other movements. He describes Sadducees and the Pharisees, the ones that we hear a lot about in the New Testament. He describes the, the Essene movement, which the New Testament doesn't bother to mention. He even describes the rebellion of the tax rebels that led to the, the Zealot movement. Now, if 
a third or a quarter of the population were becoming Christians. You think he might have mentioned it, but he does not. And that's a Jewish historian in the very place and time. Nor does anybody else mention it. Roman historians don't mention it. There is a famous letter from Pliny the Younger when he writes to the Emperor Charjan and basically says to them, you know, I've got these people called Christians. I don't know what to do with them. Now, we're speaking of the second decade of the second century. And the, here is a high-placed Roman governor who's risen through the, the various ranks of the Roman magistrate. He hasn't been involved in, in, in Christians and their arrest and persecution at all. He doesn't even know who or what they're about. So at that stage, the Romans are still ignorant of the Christians. It's the very reverse of what should be the case if there was this rapid spread of this new religion across the world. So where do you think the, the story, were this something that came from the, the Essenes or, or, or a more Gnostic sect, this particular theology, or where do you think the story began then? If, if these people are walking around and all of a sudden calling themselves Christians, do you know where they got the story from? Well, like most endeavours of the human race, this Jesus story evolved over time. It didn't all come into existence at one point in time. It wasn't a Big Bang origin. People were feeling their way towards a religious solution, that is for sure. Now, we are all familiar, I think, that the idea of a messiah was part and parcel of Jewish hopes and expectations. We're talking of a minor people, a small group on the margins of the Roman Empire, over centuries invaded and occupied by every major empire in the region, the Persians, the Greeks, the Egyptians and so on, and then eventually by the Romans. And they're obviously exploited by these various movements of colonisation. So it's not surprising there was a radical strain to their religious belief that one day a messiah would come and rescue them, and then they would be top dog. Possibly you have a similar story in Sweden. We, we have a story in Britain about uh, King Arthur, a hero from an unknown era. We had this idea of a hero figure. And, well, certainly the Jews had such a hero figure in their thoughts, not in reality. So there is one strain of the, the collective idea that eventually became Jesus of Nazareth. And... I don't think the movement began in the first century at all. It's very difficult to find any evidence of a Christian movement in the first century. I think you begin to find it in the second century, in the early second century, and particularly after the second Jewish war of Bar Kochba, which ended in 135, after that second war and the complete erasure of the Jewish part of, of the Roman Empire. Judea was erased from the map. From that point on, the fate of Judaism had to be redrawn, and it was redrawn in two particular movements. The one was the, what we have as modern rabbinic Judaism, and the other was the Christian movement. And that's where we should be looking, and that's where we do find the actual origins of the movement. Okay, that's that's pretty interesting. I never heard about that before. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. The Bar Kochba revolt, it's known as as well, I guess, then, huh? Indeed it is. Indeed it is. Everybody knows about the first Jewish war. Well, I assume that. Maybe they don't. Um, in the period of Roman occupation of the first century, there was continuous radicalisation of sections of the Jewish community because of a number of Roman prefects or procurators who were exploiting the country for their own pockets, as well as the high priests who were, had always been exploiting the country and then there was taxes to be paid for Rome. It radicalised the movement. In 66, fighting broke out and eventually, for a while, the Jews threw the Romans out of Jerusalem and radicalised much of the population. A civil war was going on at the same time between those who wanted to continue collaborating with Rome and those who didn't. And eventually the Romans got their act together and invaded and basically besieged Jerusalem and then destroyed the temple. Now that part is quite famous, the destruction of the Jewish temple in the year 70. Now, 30 years later, or 40 years later, there was a second revolt of the Jews, more in, in places like uh, Egypt and Cyprus than in pa Palestine itself. But that was a second revolt. Then a second war 
was broke out in in the year 130, led by again a militant side to, to the Jewish people, led by Simon Bar Kochba, and he was hailed as the the Messiah. And they thought this was it. They would get their comeuppance on all those who had invaded them. Mm. Of course, it just took the Romans time to marshal their many legions, invade the country again. And at that point, they erased Jerusalem off the map. Not only Judea, Jerusalem was erased off the map. And they built, built a new city called, called Aelia Capitolina. And that was a new pagan city in the centre of Judea. And so from that point on, you could say Judaism was in crisis and it's out of that crisis, I think we can say, Christianity really got up and running. So that's interesting to me because then we have, we, you, you detail a bit of the stories about some of the wars and some of the problems, uh, civil war almost in one sense, we have a strife in the region. And then if we go forward in history, as far as I know, and maybe you know more about this period, then, because we have a gap here in between up until the point of, I, I, I would say, either the councils of, Carthage, uh, which which is said to believe, uh, begin around 251, something like that, at least uh, Wikipedia states so. Uh, they, they're going up to about 419 or so. And in between there, we have the First Council of Nicaea in, in 325. Um, and, and that's when the Roman world obviously begins to adopt Christianity. And as far as we, we the stories we hear, is that that's also when, when uh, the, the myth of Jesus comes together by uh, Constantine the Emperor and, and they decide kind of how they want to how they want to put together this character pretty much. But do you know anything what happens in between that period and how could this uh, Jewish story, so, so to speak, be picked up by the Roman Empire if they were fighting forces at one point? It's a fascinating question, isn't it? Fascinating yeah. question. How does this marginal group, essentially Jewish in character, how does it capture the heart, mind and soul of the Roman Empire? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. Now, of course, the church has always had its answer. It's by the noble sacrifice of, of gentle Christians and, and being thrown to the lions in the arena. They soften the, the martial spirit of the Romans and, and introduce them to more humane values. I mean, they have a complete story to fit that position. But of course, it is actually a complete nonsense, a complete nonsense. Now, what is interesting, you started there from the Council of Carthage and so on. We have what one might call real history from about the end of the second century, as far as Christianity is concerned. In other words, we can have some confidence that the people we read about existed and that, that you know, what they wrote at least reflects what they, they wanted us to believe at the time. And we can map how the church eventually became approved of by the state and then endorsed as the official religion. A couple of things are very, very interesting about that is, mm. firstly, this dark age between supposedly the story Jesus in Nazareth and the, the crucifixion the spread of the apostles um, and then somehow there's this almost a century century or more of unknown information of darkness until we begin to get churchmen and church councils from that point on we can start to see a history again yeah now that fits perfectly of course with the idea in that dark period the church or churchmen or early christians perhaps have been fabricating the story whether willfully consciously or under some self-delusion those early machinations and bear in mind we are very aware now there was a multiplicity of rival christian movements out of that fight for correctness as it was seen then something which we now call orthodoxy emerged and it was orthodoxy which got the stamp of approval from the roman state and so that takeover is interesting but so is the fight between the rival factions of christians from let's say the, the year 100 through to the year 200 if we take that century that is when we find that great variety of Christian movements actively writing, issuing propaganda, tearing each other up, sometimes physically fighting in order to establish a truth. And we can compare this to 
any factionalised religious movement, particularly when it's in the wilderness, you only have to think of something like the Mormons, how they broke into more than one group of rival Mormons, each trying to think they are preserving the official doctrine and so on. It's a characteristic of many religious movements in this period, as they, or even political movements, as they are fighting for a position on the fringe, so they are attacking each other and often becoming more extreme or, or contrary-wise, more collaborationist and so on. And all those famous uh, movements uh, of, the, of the second century, well, they tell us a lot. They tell us a lot. So the, uh, and it's also the continuation here is, is interesting. As the, as the Roman world adopts this story and, and, and makes it uh, eventually then of the official religion of the Roman Empire, it seems also that uh, the rest of, of uh, the Jews of the, of the period are starting actually to go away from that, except, of course, the, the Messianic Judaism, which, which still believes in, in, a, in a Messiah, or even that Yeshua might have been the Messiah at that point. But there's another split taking place there again, then. Isn't, isn't that right? Where, where Judaism kind of it fall, falls back to falls back rather to its, its more uh, previous uh, stories. Uh, do you think that I've understood that correctly? There's well, you're, you're touching on an important point, yeah. The, I, I'd say what had been the Jewish movement before the complete destruction at the Bar Kochba war had had many shades of opinion. We know of the Essenes. We know that the Josephus describes the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He, descri he, he describes the, the Zealots and so on. And we know from later churchmen that the number of factions within the, the Jewish religion, numbers been put at perhaps 80 or, or more different groups. So there was not a single monolithic Judaism. There were many contending factions. But when the, the collaborationist temple priesthood was swept away, then Judaism had to decide which direction it was going in. Now, I think it, it accepted, I think with the, the, the second Jewish war, Messianic Judaism aiming at throwing out the Romans died. That idea died. I mean, it had cost enormous bloodshed, the destruction of large parts of the area. Uh, so many Jews had been sent to the slave markets and so on. Judaism had to come out anew. Now it did. It came out in one form was rabbinic Judaism, which sort of internalised a lot of the rules that had been previously uh, externalised at the temple. An Orthodox Jew would follow hundreds of rules of his behaviour and how he, he should wash his hands and how he should prepare his food and so on. Rule driven based upon the synagogue. Now, it accommodated itself to Rome. That was necessary. And so Judaism in the second, third centuries did have a prosperous period. But it's contrary-wise, there was another faction within Judaism which migrated more and more into non-Jewish communities, which was really the basis of, of what became the Christianity we know, the Catholicism that actually emerged, because yeah. it basically threw out the things that made Judaism difficult for non-Jews. It threw out circumcision and it threw out the food laws. So its story was that much more marketable. It moved away from Judaism and then started to take on board more and more of the old pagan religions. That's why Christianity is infused with pagan ideas. Yeah, see, I've heard that too, that uh, in a way Christianity is, is uh, they, they repackaged it for, for export, if we, if we put it that way. And yeah. And some of the things more simply, uh, simpler, yeah. And, I mean, just as a side note here as well for people listening, uh, in terms of, we, we talked about some of the, the schisms that, that are that were happening in, in, in Judaism and obviously are still there today. Uh, it's very difficult, obviously, to, to talk about one one church, maybe at that point, obviously, but, but still today, I mean, there's a, a approximately an estimation here that there's about 38,000 uh, Christian denominations. So it's 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 split up, and and it's all over the place, if you put it that way. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing. Anyway, uh, Ken, let's see, what do you think then in terms of the, because you mentioned earlier the, the persecu uh, persecution of the Christians, do you believe that that, that happened, or is that also a part of the, uh, the the propaganda story here? Well, there was persecution of the Christians, but I would have to say too little, too late. 
The Christians exaggerate, for their own purposes, the persecution of the Christians. And if you read the Bible, if you read the New Testament, you can see how Christians interpret very minor incidents into persecution of the church. The arrest of Peter is regarded as a persecution of the church even though he came out of prison a day later by the help of an angel. This interpretation of persecution, they play fast and loose with this idea. The idea of a martyr. Any scholar will tell you that the original meaning of martyr was a witness. But of course, they use the word very happily today because most people think of someone who has died. Not just someone who had a faith, but someone who's died. And so, so you have an issue then. When you read of an ch early church father talking of the martyrs, just what does he mean? Does he mean that there were 10 or 20 people in the town who believed and witnessed to their faith? Or, or does he mean what we are encouraged to think, that 10 or 20 of them were executed? This is how the, you, the, this idea of persecution is used in a disreputable fashion. I mean, helped with, by Hollywood, of course. We all know that, well, the only reason we have arenas is so Christians can be thrown to lions. But... There's very little evidence of any great persecution of the Christians by the Romans. For a start, you see, it's partly Christian arrogance. This marginal group was not even noticed by the Romans, far less persecuted by them. As I said earlier, in the early years of the second century, Pliny didn't even know who they were. He had to find out about them. They were, there was no early persecution of the church. Now, why would the Romans have persecuted the, the church at all is, is an interesting question. For a long while, they were regarded as Jews, and the Jews were tolerated and had certain privileges in the Roman Empire for a long time. We have church fathers, actually, in, in the third century, going on record as saying... There are relatively few martyrs for the faith who die for their faith because God protects them. He actually says it's the reverse, that the Christian God, being the correct God, protects his believers. You have to really study the, the, the whole period to discover when the Christians talk about persecution, it's usually a myth from 200 years after the event, and it's talking of a handful of people. And it's amazing how that story also obviously have been exported all over the world and, and, and all these other mythologies that existed in other places of the world has pretty much been eradicated. And, and obviously I want to get into, in, into some of the, the tactics, as it were, of the, of the Roman Catholic Church and, and, and our periods of, of the Dark Ages, the, the medieval times and how what was happening in Europe at that point. There, there's just so much to talk about here, obviously. But... I want to, before we go into that area, I want to talk a little bit about the Bible in general as well. We, we know that, uh, or, or we, there's speculation rather, if I put, put it that way, the, from various sources in terms of actually who, who, had, who wrote the Bible, who put that together. We have various kings, we have the, what is it, in 1600 something, we have the King James, uh, the authorized version or something coming out as well. Where we can go back and back all the time, and, and, and one of the trails that I found out there is that the uh, the Italian Piso family uh, was instrumental in putting the Bible together. Uh, do you know anything more about that, uh, Ken, or do you have another theory or, or some other research in terms of who actually wrote and put together the, the, the Bible? Well, yeah, the Piso connection, yes, I, I, I am aware of that. I mean, I don't give it too much credence personally, but it, but it is a theory. It is a theory, and of, of course, when you perceive that the official story is bunkum, when you perceive that it's actually propaganda for a purpose, then you do start to search for an alternative explanation as to what happened. Yes. Now, that has caused many researchers who have cottoned on to some curious but correct information tend perhaps to over-interpret it and push the point too far. If I can illustrate this, not in regard to the Piso conspiracy, but to a more recent one been put forward, there is an interesting book by Joseph Atwill called Caesar's Messiah. Now, I've been having some recent discussions with Joe on this. Now, Joe's theory is not unlike Piso, that the Romans invented Christianity. 
Piso was at the time of Nero. Joe's theory brings it forward in time, the time of Vespasian and Titus, that yes. these are the people who conquered Jerusalem and Judea, the, the victors of the First Jewish War. And Joe's theory is that having fought a war with Rome, they, they wanted to foist on the Jews a false religion and using people like Josephus, they, they wrote the Gospels. They wrote the Gospels. There is credence in this idea, I assure you, because there is an uncanny resemblance between the campaign of Titus Caesar through Galilee and eventually to Jerusalem and the perambulations of Jesus through Galilee, uh, also arriving at Jews Jerusalem. You can see a similarity, and not only a similarity in movement, there's a similarity in place names, similarity in the reference to the characters involved, enough to make you wonder. It makes you wonder, but it doesn't make me jump to the conclusion, oh, that's the whole story wrapped up then. What I think we find there, it's part of the explanation because we are talking of the development through many generations of a whole body of ideas, of stories, of uh, attributed sayings, and of course the people who wrote it were drawing on many different sources. Possibly someone writing 10 or 15 years after the first Jewish war and the campaign of Titus was inspired to write some little story relating to Jesus, but he's drawing his information from Josephus, and it's about Titus. So it might begin there. I mean, these stories obviously began with something, and somebody else later on has taken that story and they've added in something from another source. And we find this again and again. So many of the sources are from the Old Testament, but of course, yes, they will draw on current politics to make their, their story that much bit more pertinent to the times in which they live. So I don't go along with a conspiracy. What I see is the evolution of a whole ideology through several generations. I see, and, and uh, th there's other, uh, if I touch upon these theories, there are other conspiracies in one sense as well here, then, that Jesus is the basically the outcome of Cleopatra's and, and Caesar's uh, marriage. They got a son called Caesarian, but there's uh, speculation there that that was Jesus. Have you heard that before? And, and if so, what do you think about that particular theory? Yeah, well, I mean, there are many of these. There are many of these. It's a whole genre of literature, isn't it? Yes, that one might have something in it, but not what is intended. I mean, j did Jesus go to Glastonbury? Was he in India? You see, the story is simply a shadow. The story is merely a, a stick man, a pencil drawing. You can take it wherever you like. And of course, because you're having to jump linguistic boundaries, you can play all sorts of games with the origin of a name. Take the, the origin of Nazareth. Is it a place? Well, no, it was never a place at the right time. But where does the word come from? There are multiple theories. And so I would caution against adopting any single source explanation because it, it certainly is not a single source explanation. Yeah, I like that uh, way of dealing with it too because we have to have obviously uh, confirmation of, of the, the material that we do and do cross reference of, of the material that we stumble over in order to come to some kind of conclusion and some kind of. Uh, truth about the matter, and, and uh, this is you know, endless debate, and, and now we have new stuff happening in terms of uh, Dan Brown's work even, actually, with the Da Vinci Code and with the whole bloodline talk, the genealogy of Jesus, that this is also now found, and that's another uh, trail, if you will, that just kind of is taken off on, on its own, right? How, how do you view all that? Well, yeah, I love Dan Brown's stuff. It was a hokum, of course it was hokum, but he has caused millions of people to question the official story. And I think that is why it was a step forward. People now do suspect that we are being lied to, we have been lied to. We've had a very public exposure of, let's say, weapons of mass destruction. We were fooled by that for a few weeks or months and we discovered it was all untrue. And I think the point is not lost on the general public. The high and mighty at any stage might well be selling us a false story for their own purposes. Dan Brown cast doubt on the integrity of the Vatican and, and why on earth shouldn't he? Because 
a fact that is true is when, just after the Second World War, they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Vatican, for its own reasons, suppressed the publication of that for almost half a century. That is its fear of the historical truth coming out. So you don't see a more, because I've heard this from other people too, a more sinister plan almost back behind the Dan Brown story that it's it's actually to get people to go along with an update of the story now because they they as you say that they begin to get tired of the story it's like nah there's nothing really to it it's it's fraudulent so the the the, the church in one way thinks ah oh, let's let's promote this thing with the Templars and the bloodlines and and update the story to get people to 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 fall in fall in line but but yet again over a new fabrication of the story do you see that at all in that well one could admire the manner in which the Catholic Church has this sponge-like quality that it can absorb the most savage criticism and still go on its merry way. It's proved it so often with, let's say, something like the, the Shroud of Turin. Now, it doesn't actually say it's genuine, but it puts it on display so that the faithful can come and, and pray to it and touch it and the rest of it. It runs with the, the, with the foxes and hunts with the hounds, doesn't it? So I can see how the church will simultaneously endorse and insist upon the traditional values, whilst at the same time, yes, allowing a counter-current to, to run forward, that, well, Jesus actually went to Europe and, you know, sired the, the French uh, royal family or whatever he supposedly did. It's almost like divide and rule, isn't it? That's how yeah. the British ran their empire, divide and rule. Well, we let every little idea have its day, so long as we stay in the Vatican and everybody you know, still goes along with it. That's right. That's a good point. Uh, th there's so much more to, to talk about here, uh, Ken, as we, we can begin to round things up here for the first hour. I want to continue talking more with you about the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits and what you think about uh, political Zionism in the modern world uh, uh, and what happened during the medieval times or the Dark Ages, the eradication of knowledge. There, there's just so much more to talk about here. Again, then, the website is JesusNeverExisted.com and head on over there. And I, and I agree with you. I think people, uh, if it's a lot of material, like 500 pa pages to read through, uh, it's easier to do that on in, in paper format uh, than to sit and stare at a, at a monitor for all that time. So that's I think the people appreciate that as well. But um, I guess then, again, just to clarify that, the, the book is primarily available through your uh, website. Is that correct? Or can they pick up a copy somewhere else uh, as well? Okay. There are some bookshops that handle it, yeah. I've got a sort of love-hate relationship with Amazon. Occasionally, some books do ship via Amazon, but essentially the easiest route to go is to my website and they can be sent out from there, yeah. Excellent. Uh, okay, stay with us then, Ken, and we'll continue talking more here in our uh, second hour. Okay.